using Lewis structures to deduce that. And the shapes of molecules really um, can be determined with a Lewis structure that's been generated. So now let me use an example here to explain to you how two-dimensional images and three-dimensional images sometimes are different. So if we look at two Lewis structures here for this chloral fluoral methane, you can see the chlorine and the fluorine are adjacent to each other. Now we can rotate that molecule and produce the same image by simply rotating this molecule as if the chlorine were rotated upwards. And you can see that you would produce the same molecule, even though in these two Lewis structures, they're shown differently, they in fact are the same molecule because they can superimpose on each other. Now let's use another example here. I'm gonna use a second example where we have three different halogens attached to our molecule. And when we do that, we can produce two molecules here with bromine, chlorine, and fluorine attached to the carbon that are not superimposable. And to visualize that, if you take this model on the left and rotate it, and rotated it so the red would rotate here and the purple here and the green would rotate back on that side, you would see that if we rotate at two positions, that the red and the green should be side by side. Well, in this case, they're not. The green is on the other side. So these represent two molecules that are in fact isomers of each other. They are different, uh, <clears throat> the atoms are located different ge geometrically. So we're not gonna be talking about isomers, but just to show you that three-dimensional drawings are useful in visualizing the different types of isomers that can exist. Isomers, of course, are molecules that have the same formula, but different arrangements of atoms. So, so flat representations uh, done with Lewis structures don't always give the complete picture. You have to visualize sometimes molecules in three dimensions. This is a better three-dimensional representation than these are. But in reality, I mean, I could show you, uh, and I will show you later in three dimensions kind of live in a screen. So the theory we're gonna to use to arrive at the shapes of different molecules is one, it's been around for a while. It goes by the acronym VESPER, which stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. And what it assumes is that, I'm just gonna, okay. It's gonna assume that um, the electrons repel each other and they determine the shape of a molecule, this repulsive effect. So electron pairs will try to achieve the maximum distance apart. And you can get that kind of uh, shape if you've ever tied balloons together. So <clears throat> when we use VESPER theory, we're not just focused on one electron pair, but all the electron pairs, not just the bonded pairs, but the unbonded pairs as well. And if it's a double bond, we're gonna assume the double bonds have the same kind of repulsion as a single bond. So, so here's an example with balloons. If you tie balloons together in this manner, <clears throat> they will arrange themselves in a position of least energy. So you can see here, we've got three balloons tied together or six if you may, and if you arrange them, they'll take on this shape. Here we have four balloons tied together and they'll take on this particular shape, which we call tetrahedral. This one we call octahedral. This one here, we have five taken together and they will, it will take on this particular shape here, which we call trigonal bipyramidal. We're gonna go over all these shapes and how you can identify these shapes from Lewis structure. So, so here's some diagrams on the right of the various angles that you get in these particular shapes. We call that the electron group geometry. It includes all the electrons. Uh, and we're gonna use a representation that we started using yesterday, or I guess today in the previous lecture. Uh, we started using an ax notation with the atom in the central, how many pairs of electrons are surrounding the central atom and, and how many uh, atoms it's bonded to. 
and E represents the number of unbonded pairs, which influence shapes of molecules. So, so here's an example, methane. It's AX4, a carbon atom bonded to four. So you would probably say, well, it's gonna take on this particular arrangement here. So ammonia, NH3, is also going to take on a similar arrangement here, except that there's going to be atoms bonded in three locations, but an unbonded pair in the top location. So they're going to both utilize this particular electron shape, but when we look at just the atoms, we're going to get a shape that looks like this. Now, to assist you in visualizing this, uh, what I'm going to do is flip-flop to another program. The other program I'm going to flip to is if you go to uh, any web browser and type in P-H-E-T, you're going to get this website. This website is the University of Colorado, and this particular application is called Molecular Shapes. There's a whole bunch of uh, simulations on this website. I strongly encourage you to check it out. But for instance, this would be an electron arrangement of a tetrahedral shaped molecule like carbon tetrachloride. However, if I wanted to remove one of the atoms and simply put in a pair of electrons, I can see that the shape is going to change. This would be represent NH3 with an unbonded pair of electrons at the top. You can see that un unbonded pair of electrons at the top influences the shape. So this kind of shows you the shape of this particular molecule. What I like about the software is it uh, enables you to manipulate the model and, and change different uh, variables so that you can visualize different types of molecular shapes. So if I was to take out that pair of electrons, I would now get a totally different shape. We call this shape trigonal planar because they're all in the same plane. This would be represented by something like aluminum, chloride, aluminum in the middle three chlorines, whereas this it would be represented by something with five electrons in its valence shell because the central atom here would supply those two electrons plus one each of, in each of these bonding locations. So, so something like nitrogen in the middle bonded to, to hydrogen, which contributes one electron in each of these bonds, or nitrogen bonded to three chlorines, so you can use family substitutions to arrive at equivalent shapes. So for instance, this shape could be any element from group five, could be any of these, and the um, atoms that are not in the center, the atoms are on the outside, non-central atoms or terminal atoms could be any halogen or they could be hydrogen. So I hope that allows you to visualize a little better the shapes I'm talking about here. So the first shape would be represented by a substance that has two valence shell electrons attached to a halogen. Mainly the elements, the terminal uh, elements will be <clears throat> uh, halogens. So this particular shape would be linear if I'm gonna visualize it with my, with my model here, sorry. Um, I could remove some of these and I could see there's my shape. And if I wanted to know the name of the electron geometry, linear and the molecular geometry is linear. So the electron geometry, don't really ask you that as much. I really am more concerned with the molecular geometry, but you can see if you click, it'll give you both names. So. <laughs> So we would describe this as a central atom bonded to two atoms, or I could call it a 220, where two represents the number of electron pairs surrounding the central atom, two represents the number of atoms, and zero represents, in this case, the number of unshared pairs. So, and there are what the numbers stand for in my three number code, which is the number three number code I feel most comfortable with when I'm thinking about molecular shapes. So. Now the beryllium doesn't fill its octet shell in this situation. Uh, to do so would require making the chlorines in this case, 
have a positive formal charge, and that's impossible because chlorine is more electronegative than beryllium. So that's why, for instance, you cannot make a, a beryllium chloride molecule by filling that octet. So let's look at another example here. So I'm going to swap it again and add another one here. So you can see here's the shape I'm talking about. And we would call this a 330. I would call that a 330. The central atom is an atom that will provide three valence shell electrons to share in three locations. And these will be chlorine, bromine, fluorine, iodine, or hydrogen. So again, we call that a trigonal planar shape. You're required to know the shapes of all these molecules. You're only allowed to use your periodic table on your tests, not a list of all the names of the shapes. Unfortunately, I'm going to ask you to rem uh, remember those shapes. So it's going to take a bit of work on your part. So we could say the central atom is bonded to three other atoms. There's no unshared pairs. And we give it a designation with, of a 330. Now, again, we've already shown methane. It's an AX4 arrangement. It's a 440. There's a picture of it. Uh, ammonia is another shape. So the ammonia shape is really derived from this basic shape, except you remove one hydrogen and show the electron pair. I've shown that. This, we're going to call it a pyramidal shape. You could call it trigonal pyramidal if you so desire. You could just call it pyramidal. This shape we call tetrahedral. And then we could, if you take a look at uh, the water molecule, which I'll show here, in the water molecule based on that tetrahedral arrangement of electrons. So here I'm going to uh, remove an electron pair and I'm going to add two pairs of electrons that are unbonded. Again, we could figure out exactly how many valence shell electrons this atom is going to provide by knowing that those two electrons and those two electrons are being provided by the central atom. So there's four, and then there's going to be one electron involved in the bonding in these two locations. So six. So we know the central atom in this case has to come from, um, sorry, let's go back here, has to come from uh, something that has six valence shell electrons, which would be, of course, this family here, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium, and the other <clears throat> non-central atoms, two of them will come from this family or hydrogen. So you could get H2O, you could get Cl2S or SCl2, SEF2, TEI2, any of those will give that familiar shape, which we call angular or bent. So again, to show you molecular shape here, here's what it looks like. Okay, so, and it shows you down here. Now, if we remove a last pair of electrons, if we remove an atom, sorry, here, I can get that shape. Whenever you have just two atoms, it's always gonna be linear. So if you have electron pairs on either side here that are being unshared, you're going to get this particular shape. So the central atom is going to provide one, two, three, four, group five. It's going to be a group five with a halogen. So call that shape linear. Notice the electrons aren't involved in the shape. Only the atoms are involved in naming the shape. So, <clears throat> so there are basically three unshared pairs of electrons. In this case, with water, there are two unshared pairs of electrons, and that's how we designate it. So you can either use my notation that says 422, four being number of electron pairs around the center atom, two being the number of atoms, two being the number of unshared pairs. And so if we look at this designation here, okay, we're gonna have one central atom bonded to one other atom with three unshared pairs. So I could still call this one, two, three, four pairs of electrons around the center atom. So I could go four, one, three, four, one, three could be the three number designation for that one. Okay, And again, that's what the numbers stand for. Now, we've already looked at this particular shape. So again, the electron pair domain geometry is how many electrons are surrounding it. 
they, even though the electron pairs are there, if they're not being shared with other atoms, they're not going to contribute to the shape. So the angle in this particular molecule would be 109.5. So we can look at that here. So let's take a look. Let's simply remove those two and then add two more. So, and we can see show bond angles. We can see it shows you the bond angles here. Now, the, <clears throat> again, the electron geometry in this case is a tetrahedral. If I was to replace one of those atoms with a pair of electrons, you can see the angles remain the same, but the shape is trigonal pyramidal, even though the electron geometry is tetrahedral. So when I refer to the shape of the molecule, typically I'm talking about just the atoms, not the electron pair. If I refer to the electron geometry, then I'm gonna to refer to the shape as if there was an atom where the electron pair is. So I could remove the second atom and put another unbonded pair. And then we get, of course, a shape for something like water. Again, the central atom has to supply six electrons, those two, those two, one each from those two. Okay, and then I could take off another bond and stick in another pair and I get that linear shape. All of those shapes are derived from the same electron geometry. So that's the point I'm trying to make. Now the two examples have lone pairs which occupy a larger domain and they push the bonding pairs a little bit and reduce the bond angles just ever so slightly. So, so. For our purposes, we're going to consider them to be about the same as that model was showing. So here just shows you again, this is a 431, this is a 422, this is a, a 413. So we call the molecular shape here uh, pyramidal or trigonal pyramidal. We call this one angular and we call this one linear. <laughs> Okay, to go over what we've just done. Now, we're gonna move on to when we put five pairs of electrons around the center atom. So I'm gonna go back to my model here and let's just remove these pairs and we can get a bunch of different shapes of molecules based on this familiar geometry here. All right, so you can see there's a trigonal or tr triangle arrangement in the middle. So we can call this trigonal around the middle and then by pyramid, because if you could have a pyramid at the top and a pyramid at the bottom, if you're going to enclose this molecule. So there is our basic shape. So if I was going to uh, draw a Lewis structure of this, I would have an atom in the center that supplies one, two, three, four, five electrons for bonding. And that would be a, a, an element from, from the group that supplies, sorry, five valence shell electrons. So it could be anything from this family bonded to five other atoms. So P, F5, AS, CL5, SB, H5. So all those are possible molecular shapes that would be trigonal bipyramidal. AX5 designated using X, there's no unshared pairs. We call that a 550. Now let's talk about what happens when we remove an atom from one of them and the types of molecules that we'll get from that. So, <clears throat> so if I was to take off one of these atoms and put in a shared pair, now, if I put the shared, the unshared pair of electrons at the top, I can kind of visualize that this molecule is shaped kind of like a seesaw, you know, a toy that used to be in the uh, playgrounds when I was a child, they've since taken them out because a lot of kids lost their teeth on these seesaws. I've seen that happen. We used to call them teeter-totter, seesaw, but that's, that's the molecular shape of this particular molecule. Now, if I'm trying to figure out what Lewis structure would coincide with this, the central atom is gonna supply those two, plus one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those. So it's two, three, four, five, six. So the central atom will supply six electrons. And we know from experience, that will be the, this family here, the oxygen family. So 
uh, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, any of those bonded with halogens or hydrogen will give that particular arrangement. Okay. So if I was going to give this a three number code, I would say, well, there's five pairs of electrons around the center joined to four atoms with one unshared pair, five, four, one. And we call that a seesaw shape. All right. Now, that's another term I came across in, the, in a textbook, but I'm, I'm just going to call it a seesaw. Dysphenidyl, I think is how you pronounce that word. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you the shape that you get with a molecule when I remove one of those atoms and put in another unbonded pair of electrons. Okay. You can see now that you're going to end up with this particular shape here. So it's best visualized for shape when you look at it from this orientation. We call a T-shape. Look at the atoms again, not the electron pairs. So <clears throat> the central atom in this case is going to supply those two electrons, those two electrons. So plus one each of these three, and these will be halogens or a hydrogen. So two, four, five, six, seven. So this would be Chlorine bonded to three fluorines are going to give this T-shaped arrangement. And the uh, three number code I would use to describe it, there's one, two, three, five pairs of electrons around the center joined to three atoms with two unshared pairs. So I call it a five, three, two. Okay. And again, I've showed you it's, it's, there, it's a combination involving halogens in the ratio of one to three. Now, the next shape I would come to, if I remove, again, another atom from this bonding arrangement, stick in another pair of electrons, we can get this particular shape. In this case, the central atom is going to supply two, four, six, one of those, and one of those, eight electrons. So where do we find eight electrons? We find them here. So neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. Probably the most likely candidate would be xenon. <clears throat> so there's going to be a single atom of xenon and two fluorines, or a single atom of xenon and two chlorines. That shape is called linear. It's straight. And the three number code 523 also has the ax designation of A, is bonded to two atoms with three unshared pairs. All right, now, again, for five electron group molecules, electron do domain geometry is always trigonal bipyramidal. We're gonna go back a little bit. The first molecule, PCl5, has ideal angles of 90 degrees. So the 90 degree angles would be between these atoms and 120 degrees between the axial well, atoms, like here, 120. So let's just put one of those up on the screen. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to remove those three. So again, here's what we're talking about. Okay. Now, it's not showing the angles between the three that are on the same plane. Now, when you remove the atoms, typically what happens is if I'm going to, this is a 550 arrangement, I'm going to remove it and put in a pair of electrons. That's where we get our seesaw shape, a 541. Again, the central atom is now going to be supplying two, three, four, five, six. So it's uh, a, an atom that supplies six valence shell electrons like sulfur and these would be chlorines, SCL4. So if I remove another one <clears throat> and put in another pair of electrons here, I'm going to get this shape, which is called a T-shape. So again, we would designate that as a five pairs of electrons around the center joined to three atoms with two unshared pairs, five, three, two. And the central atom is going to supply two, four, five, six, seven electrons. So it's going to be a halogen with three other halogens, okay, like fluorine tribromide, 
would be this particular shape. And so that's how we visualize the shapes there. So I could take off another one, put another lone pair in. Now you can see this is called linear molecule. And a linear molecule, the central atom is going to supply those two, those two, and those two, six, one of those, one of those for a total of eight. So that, again, the central atom will come from uh, the noble gases beyond helium, bonded to two halogens. Okay. And that shape is linear. So those are all the derived shapes, if you may, from this electron geometry of 550. And we already talked about the seesaw shape, which I just showed you. Okay, this is that seesaw shape again, seesaw shape, a little bit of a word twister. Uh, you, you can't see the other electron, it's over here somewhere. So, so again, this would be a five, <clears throat> five pairs of electrons around the center join the four atoms with one, one unshared pair, five, four, one. The central atom is going to supply those two, plus one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those. So five, <clears throat> so two, three, four, five, six. So central atom is going to be sulfur, selenium, tellurium, and these will be four fluorines, four chlorines, or four iodines. Right? So this is another way of visualizing it. So again, we are going to look at this. You can see the central atom is going to supply two, four, five, six, seven. So it's fluorine with three chlorines. And again, the shape, it's an upside down T shape here. The three number code would be a five, three, two. Five electron pairs around the center joined to three atoms with two unshared pairs. And if we're using our ax designation, it's a single atom joined to three atoms with two unshared pairs, A, X3, E2. Now I'm gonna to switch to shapes derived if I have six. So I'm gonna take these off and add six here. And now we have got a potential geometric shape that is octahedral in shape, eight faces, four on the top, four on the bottom, triangular faces that you could use to block all these in. And the central atom in this case is going to supply one of each of those bonded electron pairs, one. So there's six of them. So it's going to be group six. So it's sulfur bonded to one, two, three, four, five, six halogens. So SF6 or SEI6 would give you this particular shape. <laughs> Now, if we take off an electron pair, uh, let's take off an atom, sorry, and replace it with an unbonded electron pair, that's going to give us a square pyramidal shape. Let me let you visualize this. So if I take off one of those atoms and replace it with a pair of electrons, to easily visualize this, you can rotate a little bit, and now you can see the shape of the molecule is, <coughs> is changed. So we call this a square base pyramid or square pyramidal is how I refer to this. If I was deciding what atom would be in the center, it's gonna supply two electrons here. One, so two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this would be iodine bonded to one, two, three, four, five chlorines. So I, uh, Cl5. It could conceivably be six, a crystal involving, um, six iodines, I guess. Okay, so the, cha the name of this is, again, a square base pyramid or a square pyramidal. If I'm uh, looking at a three number designation, there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six pairs of electrons around the center bonded to five atoms. So it's six, five, and then one unshared pair, six, five, one, is what I would call that particular shape, six, five, one. And if I remove a second electron or a second atom from the shape, I'm going to get another sh another molecular shape. So again, to show you, I'm going to remove an atom here, and I'm going to put in another pair of electrons. So now when I look at this, I can see 
it is a square planar shape. So they're all in the same straight line plane, just like when you have trigonal planar, except now it's square planar. So we call that square planar. The central atom is going to supply those two electrons, those two. So central atom is going to supply two, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this would have to come from the noble gas family beyond helium. So it could be xenon, radon, and bonded to four halogens or hydrogen. That will give you this particular shape, square planar shape. So we give it a ax designation as a single atom joined to four atoms with two unshared pairs. Now the electron domain geometry is octahedral because there was always six, array, six electron pairs around it. So there's the basic electron domain geometry. And again, the difference. So the electron geometry are all the electrons in the atoms. So remember, it's the same. If I, I still have the same electron geometry. It's octahedral, but the name, the molecular geometry changes because the unshared electron pair does not, is not part of that molecular geometry. It certainly causes um, the shape to take on what it does, but that's the system that we're using. So if I removed for instance, another atom and put in another unshared pair. That's where I get square planar, a 642. I put in an, <clears throat> okay. So CLF5 has one lone pair and five bonding pairs. That's the square pyramid I was talking about, this one. Again, we can count the number of electrons the central atom supplies. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's going to be a halogen bonded to five other halogens. It's a square pyramid shape. Electron geometry would be octahedral. So here's another example again with, from the model I've been illustrating. This would be a 642. It's a square planar. And the ax would be a central atom. A is bonded to four atoms and there's two unshared pairs. So each of these, now let's do a little bit of a kind of a run through. So I would call that a 422 because there's four pairs of electrons around the center joined to two atoms. The shape is gonna be angular. The ax is a single atom joined to two atoms with two unshared pairs. And the central atom is gonna supply two, four, five, six electrons. So it's gonna be from that family and two fluorines would be an example. Of course, there's many, many different examples you could use, as I said in the past. You could use family substitutions. It could be um, something, it could be selenium with two chlorines. It could be tellurium with two bromines. Okay. Now the sulfur supplies, again, both the unshared electron pairs plus one each from those covalent bonds. Okay. Somebody have a question? All right, I'll continue on here. So the non-central atoms in, in my model will always be halogens or hydrogens. <clears throat> so in this case, here we have a shape. It looks like a, if I look at the atoms, it's a square planar shape. It's gonna be one, two, three, four, six pairs of electrons around the center join the four atoms. So it's a six, four, two. The shape, if we just look at the atoms, is square planar. The ax designation is a single atom joined to four atoms with two unshared pairs. So again, the central atom is going to have to supply two, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's going to have to be in the, um, in the family of noble gases attached to four bromine atoms. And the shape of the molecule, again, is a square planar shape. So if we look at this example, now this, uh, these examples I'm giving you is something I would ask you on a test. So I could give you a diagram of the shape and then ask you to tell me the name of the shape. Could ask you for the name of the electron geometry. Could ask you for a potential formula that would fit the shape. 
So again, we go central atom. It's got one, two, three, four, five pairs of electrons around the center joined to three atoms. So it's five, three with two unshared pairs, five, three, two. So it's uh, the central atom A is bonded to three atoms. So A, X, three, E, two. And again, the central atom is going to supply two, four, five, six, seven. So it's going to be a halogen attached to three other halogens. So when you visualize this, it's a T shape. If I flipped it up, you could see it would be T shaped. So in this case, you can see one, two, three, four pairs of electrons around the center joined to three atoms, one unshared pair, four, three, one, A, X, three, E. So this is going to be a pyramidal shape. And some more examples here. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, one is a seesaw. A, X, four, E, one. And central atom is going to supply two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be something like sulfur attached to four iodines. In this case, selenium bonded to four bromines. So there's family substitutions. And the shape, seesaw. This example, one, two, three, four, five, it's a six, five, one. It's a square based pyramid. A, X, four, E. Uh, AX5 E <clears throat> and then central atom is going to supply two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a halogen attached to five other halogens. So iodine with five fluorides. Square based pyramid. The next one, central atom, it's it's one, two, three, four, six. Six would be the first number. Six atoms, so it's a six six zero. There is there are no unshared pairs. Six six zero. We call that an octahedral. And the central atom is going to supply one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So it's going to be from uh, a family supplying six electrons. That would be an example TEH six of a formula that would fit. Now this example here, central atom is going to supply two, four, six, seven, eight electrons. So it's going to be from the noble gas family with two halogens. The three number code would be one, two, three, four, five, two, three, five, two, three. The formula would be A, X, two, E, three. And the shape is linear. Okay, now shapes of double bonds. So we're gonna assume the double bonds take uh, have the same amount of repulsion as the single bonds, just for the sake of uh, simplicity. So we have a few here. What's the Lewis structure of this? Well, this is carbon dioxide. If we come up with the Lewis structure, we would say uh, carbon supplies four, oxygen supplies six. Six and six is 12, 16 electrons. <coughs> we have an arrangement where we have eight electrons around each oxygen. We've created double bonds to make carbon more stable. So if I was gonna, gonna show you that molecule with this model here, I could show you double bonds like this. And you can see CO2 is linear in shape. Three number code, four pairs of electrons around the center join the two atoms, no unshared pairs. So it's a four, two, zero. Central, <coughs> central atom joined to two other atoms. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when the second two numbers don't add up to the first number, typically it's because of double bonds or triple bonds. So shape we've established, there it is, is linear. <coughs> so let's talk about CF2. What's the Lewis structure? Could run into some problems with this example here. CF2. Well, one possible Lewis structure looks like this. But in this case, fluorine would have a positive one formal charge because fluorine supplies seven electrons. When we apply the rules for formal charge, we get seven, take away four, take away two, a one plus charge. Can fluorine ever have a positive one charge, formal charge? No, it's way too electronegative for that. So 
even though th theoretically this is a shape you could come up with, but it's wrong. So in reality, probably the best shape would, would look like this, a pair of electrons, one pair of electrons, uh, unshared plus two shared pairs gives you an angular shape. So the three number code here would be three pairs of electrons around the center joined to two atoms with one unshared pair. This is a, a, a very unstable uh, structure. So, and the shape is angular. Now let's look at SO2, what's the Lewis structure? So again, if we look at a Lewis structure like this, we see sulfur has uh, one, we would have three, six, 18 electrons in all. So in order to stabilize sulfur and oxygen and create a noble, like a formal charge that's a little bit less, then you would say sulfur has, in this case, six, take away two, take away one, two, three, four, take away another four, gives you zero. Oxygen would be two, four, six, two, four, six. This is the most stable arrangement where the formal charges are all gonna be zero. We've looked at this before. So the three number code, there's one, two, three, four, five electron pairs around the center, joined to two atoms with one unshared pair. It's a five, two, one. And its shape, if we take a look at it, okay, let's add another one here. And uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this. So in essence, that's what it looks like. Notice this pair of electrons, unbonded influences the shape. If I take that, we uh, it's a linear shape, but now that that's present, you can see what atom it is. And if you're looking at the electrons and the shape, this is it, SO2. Another representation of what the shape would look like, angular. Now, an SO3, if you look at this particular arrangement here, uh, formal charge in oxygen would be six, take away four, take away two. This would be minus one here, minus one here and a zero here and sulfur would be six, take away one, two, three, four, plus two. Even though that's a Lewis structure that works, the formal charges look like they're too high. So oxygen would be minus one, as I said, sulfur would be plus two, and the double bonded oxygen would be zero. That's this oxygen here. This is a single bonded oxygen, what I'm talking about here. So can we change the Lewis structure to make it more stable by lowering the formal charges? Yes, we certainly can. Again, we've been transferring from the uh, atoms that have negative formal charge to the atoms with positive formal charges. So sulfur has a positive two formal charge, so we could in fact reduce them by creating another double bond. We could look at that one, determine a formal charge here. Sulfur, again, is still plus one. It's still too high. Well, oxygen, the single bonded oxygen over here is gonna be minus one oxygen. The double bonded oxygens are, are gonna be zeros. So this is more probable than the previous structure. So this one lowers the formal charges even further. So. This is the most probable structure because of the lowering of formal charges all to zero. <clears throat> so the three number code here, well, one, two, three, four, six pairs of electrons around the center atom joined to three atoms with no unshared pairs. So if I was gonna look at the shape in our uh, PHET simulation on molecular shapes, we're gonna take away that and put in another. We're gonna look at that so you can see better when you rotate this molecule, you can see it is trigonal planar shape. So SO3, trigonal planar. Now, when we predict the polarity of molecules, just check my time here, okay. <coughs> 
So the electronegativity values are used to determine the bonding type dependent on, in this case, it looks like it's a polar molecule because one atom has a much stronger pull on electrons than the other. So now the electron density is gonna shift from the more electronegative fluorine atom to the more electronegative fluorine atom in this case. So the hydrogen end of the molecule becomes electron poor and slightly blue. The fluorine end of the molecule becomes more negative because the fluorine has a much stronger pull on electrons. It's got way more protons in its nucleus. <clears throat> so when we look at a dipole moment, you're not required to figure out these numbers, but uh, you, you can use vector analysis to determine them. In this case, the nitrogen atom has a greater electronegativity than the hydrogen. So this would be a pyramidal shape for the molecule. It's a tetrahedral electron arrangement in ammonia. And the pull resultant dipole moment is kind of a directional analysis of which way the electrons are pulling. So in this case, we can say the molecule is polar because one end of the molecule is particularly negative. So the electron density shifts in this case toward the nitrogen away from the hydrogen. And since the negative and the positive charges are in separate places in space, we can say this molecule is polar. So we can not only describe the polarity of the bonds, but we can describe the polarity of the molecules themselves. So any pyramidal shaped molecule that has two atoms of different electronegativities will be slightly polar. The greater the difference in electronegativities between the atoms, the, more, the greater the dipole moment. So for instance, if I was taking a look at NH3 and comparing its polarity to, to another molecule, NH3, we could say, okay, pH3, would it be more polar or less polar? Well, if we look at the electronegativity of nitrogen, it's greater than phosphorus. So pH3 would be almost nonpolar. Very, very slight difference because hydrogen and phosphorus almost have the same electronegativity. So, so it would not nearly be as polar, pH3. It would be very, very slightly polar if I substituted phosphorus for nitrogen. <clears throat> Again, it's this uh, extra electron pair that creates the polarity. If I take off this electron pair, it's gonna be trigonal planar shaped. And in that case, if it's trigonal planar, the forces would balance themselves out. That lone pair of electrons that's unshared creates the polar molecule. So. <clears throat> so the nitrogen end of the molecule, like I've said, is negative and the hydrogen end is positive. So the positive region would be kind of in the middle of those three hydrogen atoms. So if I was going to show you NH3 here, so. This is how I would create it. So NH3, so if you think about it, the positive end of the molecule would be in space somewhere between these three atoms is the positive region. The negative region is up here somewhere because of this electron pair plus the shared electrons between the nitrogen and hydrogen are all being pulled closer to the nitrogen. So, so there's a, a negative region above this atom, a positive region down here. That's what creates the polarity of the molecule. <clears throat> now, when we change it so that we have nitrogen bonded to a more electronegative element like fluorine, fluorine is more electronegative than nitrogen. So now the poles are gonna be towards the fluorine away from the nitrogen. We're still gonna get a polar molecule, but not nearly as polar. The dipole moment is much smaller because the fluorine is, is more negative it's going to be the negative end, despite the fact that the pair of electrons is here. If these were fluorine atoms, the negative region would be here. Positive region is somewhere up here. <clears throat> so again, the dipole moment pointing downward, which is what I'm indicating with these arrows. So there's the resultant dipole moment, because there's three of them pull, pulling on one pole here, results in a downward dipole moment only with fluorine because of its excessive electronegativity of 3.98. <clears throat> and again, we can use the vector sums to figure out those dipole moments. You're not required to figure out those dipole moments. So this molecule is polar with the 
nitrogen end of the molecule is positive and the fluorine end is negative because of the extreme electronegativity difference. Now, what I'm doing is showing you a chart here that shows you different substances with different shapes and I indicate whether they're polar or nonpolar. If you take a look, you can see there's a pattern here that tells you the polarity related to the shape. So what is the pattern that I'd like you to see? <clears throat> so the difference between the nonpolar and the polar shapes. So if you look at the polar, here's another polar one. You can see here's another polar one. All right. You can see there is a pattern. So typically, <clears throat> what conclusion can you make? Symmetrical shapes with identical non-central atoms are nonpolar. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is what I mean by that. So let me give an example here. That's nonpolar. If, however, I add an electron pair to it, that becomes polar. Now we're assuming that these atoms are all the same. Three chlorines joined to a nitrogen, for instance, because it has to supply five electrons. Now, if I was gonna put in another pair domain here, again, we have a T-shaped molecule, that's gonna be polar. Now, if I look at this shape, however, I'm going to see that these, I'm just going to take out that one and replace it with that, okay? That's nonpolar if these are all the same atoms because of the shape. If <clears throat> these, with this particular shape, they cancel each other out because when I average this region and this region is in the middle of the central atom, when I average these four, it's in the middle of the central atom, the charges, even though they're different electronegativities, will cancel each other out with this particular shape. That's what I mean by nonpolar. The symmetry, it's a symmetrically shaped molecule. It's going to be nonpolar. If, however, I stick in, like I said, another example here, that's not symmetrically shaped, right? That's a seesaw shape. That's going to be polar. Okay. So, Here's your homework. What I'd like you to do, predict each of the following molecules, if it has a dipole moment or not. Okay. And then answer these questions here. You can tell me if it's polar or not. And I'll take that up at the start of the next lesson. Okay. So I'm just going to stop recording here. <clears throat>